But the German Revolution is one of these events, if had it been successful, it could have changed everything. It could have changed not just what happened in Russia, it probably would have changed um, what happened in the rest of the world. And it, we could live in a quite different different world. It was hugely important. It was hugely important to, to Lenin, the German working class. And I'm sure we're, we're touching on that. And we did at the session last week. Um, not that we would have learned about it in school in Germany, but that's probably similar to uh, British children not learning much about chartism or anything about our, our own movement. It's uh, kept quiet. So our, our series of webinars, I think, is, is quite important, looking at our own history, looking at what, what, what we've done right, what we've done wrong in the past, and how we can avoid making the same mistakes over and over again. So we've got uh, on our website a number of uh, videos and educational uh, materials. I hope uh, comrades can go and look it up, labourleft.org, and of course join the Labour Left Alliance. So the format of this session is um, Pat's going to start and talk about the leading up to the German Revolution and its eventual defeat, um, talking about 20-25 minutes, and I think Ben's going to take a um, look at, at some of the misconception, misconceptions about the German revolutions that exist on the left. So let's get started with Pat. Okay. Um, right, well, for those people who, who question why we look at things from the past, um, I would say it's because, as much as we might like to think so, we haven't changed as much as we like to think. Uh, that that the the trends that happen in the labor movement in the, on the left tend to repeat themselves and it's a, it's a good idea to study the past if you don't you want to avoid making the same mistakes that's an old adage but i think it's very true now in my own political life uh, whenever i've read about the this tumultuous, tumultuous history of germany from the outbreak of the first world war to the coming to power of hitler in the 1930s I've always had a questions about why the socialist revolution failed to take place. I mean, after all, the revolution had succeeded in Russia, which was a backward country with a small working class. And it, the industrialized Germany with a mass, a mass at least formerly Marxist Social Democratic Party, surely offered far greater opportunities for a socialist transformation. You know, you had the majority of the population were working people, unlike in Russia where the majority were peasants, for example. And also, after the dramatic events that ended the First World War and brought down the old regime, events that included mutinying soldiers, revolutionary-minded workers flooding onto the streets, spread of Soviets across the country, and with such inspiring revolutionary leaders such as Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, why did the German Revolution fail? Now, I have read accounts which sought to emphasize that the reformist social democratic leaders were to blame for the failure of the revolution. And there's no doubt, of course, that they played a key role in putting down the revolution. But reformist leaders were never going to lead a revolution. For us to expect that to happen is, is, a, is a bit daft. Um, why were the revolutionary forces not able to win the masses away from these reformist leaders and lead them on to victory? I've also read other accounts that have sought to say that the workers were not really ready to make revolution in Germany that an aristocracy of labor, the skilled workers, prevented them from doing so. And we discussed this in a previous session with Kevin Bean about Britain. But ironically, it was this so-called aristocracy of labor that were in the vanguard of the revolutionary actions to end the war, uh, the metal workers and so on. And they were in the vanguard of the revolution movements that followed the war. So I think the, the skilled workers became the very backbone of the communist movement. So I don't think that explains it either. Um, more fundamental are those arguments that there were no real opportunities for revolution in Germany. But when one looks carefully at the events, events that included governments collapsing, attempted coups, uprising, hyperinflation, the emergence of mass left and mass communist parties with military wings, one can be forgiven for believing that there were serious chances for revolution. Indeed, the final coming to power of Hitler's counter-revolutionary Nazi party is in many ways evidence in and of itself of the real danger that revolution posed to the German elite from the left, which is why they financed Hitler and supported him. After all, why would the industrialists and the generals have handed power to a counter-revolutionary movement of such ferocity if they had not thought that revolution threatened their rule? Now, the last explanation that I've heard for the failure of the German workers to make a revolution is that it had an immature communist movement which through its own mistakes threw their chances away. 
I tend to think that this is perhaps the better explanation. Um, however, that, that does leave one thinking that the outcome was sad, but somehow inevitable. You know, that, that revolutionary leaders in Germany tried their best, but were unlucky, or that events were not favorable enough for them to succeed, that the movement was just too immature. And this left me with nagging doubts. So I decided to do my own research with an open mind to look at all the actors involved. And none other, none, no more important, of course, was uh, Rosa Luxemburg. So it's on Rosa that I tend to focus this outline. Of course, she's not the only character who played an important role, but she, in my mind, she was one of the most important. So let me start by saying that I'm a big fan of Rosa Luxemburg. She was one of the outstanding socialists of the 20th century, a brilliant writer, a great speaker, a selfless champion of working people. And as we can see from her letters, a lovely human being. However, she ended up as a tragic figure, failing to achieve the German socialist revolution she so wished for and ended up being shot by semi-fascist troops and dumped in a canal. Now, there have been countless sessions devoted to her glorious memory, but I don't believe that we do service to these great comrades by always just praising them. We also need to learn from their mistakes. Now, in this very short time I have available, I want to bring out a few of these mistakes that I think help explain why the German Revolution ended in failure. And in fact, that these lessons, if you listen to them, you'll find they're very relevant to today. In particular, I'd like to talk about the two main negative tendencies of the labor movement, reformism and sectarianism, and how Rosa responded to both of these, these, uh, these faults. Now, Marx and Engels had a vision of the development of mass working class parties. They favored these parties and they pushed for them. And they foresaw, they foresaw that however these parties began, whatever faults they might have had, as long as they retained their independence from the capitalists, they would come to adopt a socialist anti-capitalist program and would make the revolution. This was linked to their assumption that capitalism would divide into two antagonistic classes, an increasingly concentrating powerful capitalist elite and an increasingly poor and militant proletariat. Marx also thought that the early sectarian tendencies among sections of workers was a sign of the immaturity of the proletariat and would disappear as the socialist movement progressed. Unfortunately, in both cases, events proved Marx and Engels wrong. First of all, the second half of the 19th century saw the emergence of an increasingly strong proletariat in Europe and North America, a proletariat that was able to wrest some of the wealth being created, created by capitalism growth and expansion across the world. The result was the emergence of a reformist wing in the trade unions and social democratic movements in Europe and across the Atlantic. And in Germany, this tendency was, however, in Germany, this tendency towards reformism was first kept in check by a number of factors. First off, by the anti-socialist laws, which were introduced by Bismarck in 1878 and lasted until 1890 when they lapsed after he resigned. Now, these anti-socialist laws made, virtually made most of the activities of the uh, Social Democratic Party in Germany illegal and forced a lot of their leaders to go into exile and be refugees. And that made it very difficult for reformists to come forward uh, and play a key role because they, they tended to fear these laws and wanted to act in ways that were legal. The, the other factor that was important was the role of the, the, the leadership of the Social Democratic Party. First and foremost, of course, by Frederick Engels, who after, after Marx died, um, was regarded as the teacher and guide of the SPD. Um, his book, Socialism, Utopia, Utopian and Scientific, um, was, was a tremendous, had a tremendous success in spreading the ideas of socialism and making them accessible to people. And, uh, and, and had a huge influence on the leadership of the SPD. Engels was seen as a living link to the Marxist inheritance of the party. Also, leaders like Wilhelm Liebnick and August Bebel in this period, I mean, later on, Bebel started to degenerate, but in this period, they played a very key role in maintaining the, the revolutionary credentials of the party. And they kept the SPD on a consistent path towards a socialist future in Germany. And we saw this in the Erfurt program in 1891, which had formally established the SPD's program as Marxist. It was actually written by Bernstein and Kautsky and corrected by Engels, and it did itself have some faults. But generally speaking, it was accepted as, as a major step forward in the party's program. 
Uh, when Engels attended his uh, last conference, the SPD, in 1894, the moment he entered the Congress, he, there was, the whole Congress went crazy and there was a standing ovation that lasted for, I think it was something like half an hour. Um, now, unfortunately, um, in that period, 1891 to 1895, when Engels died, he became increasingly critical of developing opportunist tendencies in the SPD. And these tendencies were emerging because the SPD had been ma effectively been made legal and the party's machinery was growing and its support was growing. And out of the woodwork were coming people who thought, ah, well, this is a, a platform that's worth joining, um, you know, uh, jump, jumping on the bandwagon, so to speak. Um, immediately, uh, unfortunately, in 1895, uh, Engels died of throat cancer. And immediately afterwards, uh, the next year, uh, Bernstein, who had been um, very close to uh, Eng Engels, he emerged as the champion of the revisionist reformist wing of, uh, of the Social Democrats. And he opposed uh, the, the aim of, the, you know, the achievement of socialism, he said was not important. It was the struggle towards it and the movement that was important. Um, I would like to go into more details about that, um, but if anybody wants to ask questions, please do so. Now, a big debate developed within the Social Democrats about uh, between uh, socialism and, and reformism. And uh, this is where Luxembourg, Rosa Luxembourg, came to prominence. And uh, she had arrived in Germany from Poland um, to actually, uh, she had come because of, uh, the, to do with the Polish uh, socialist movement. But very quickly, she became involved in the SPD's affairs, and she published a, a tremendous pamphlet called Reform or Revolution, and she started speaking around the country opposing Bernstein. Now, uh, one of the mistakes made about this pamphlet, Reform or Revolution, was that some people have thought that uh, Luxembourg was arguing that you should be for revolution and not for reform. It wasn't the case. She said that we have to argue for reform and revolution but that we mustn't, let, um, revolu mustn't take revolution off the agenda, otherwise we will be lost. Um, now, the, in that big debate in the, in the party, the party centre, uh, the, still uh, clung to the, the tenets of Marxism, and the left wing led by Rosa Luxemburg, defeated the revisionists. But the revisionists had organised as a faction and were building up their support, continued to build up their support within the party. Luxembourg, this is where I think Luxembourg made her first major mistake. She opposed the existence of the revisionist faction, not just because of their politics, but she opposed them having a faction at all. And she argued incorrectly that the SPD was a party of many shades that did not need factions. And she therefore argued for this faction to be suppressed by the party. And the center of the party, not surprisingly, agreed with that and took steps to suppress the faction. In fact, of course, uh, the faction didn't, uh, it just went underground and continued to build. And any dialectical understanding of the SPD as, a, as a, a mass party with millions of members would surely recognize that the party would reflect the divisions that existed within the proletariat and among the socialist intelligentsia. And it would accept to have the need to have platforms within the parties to represent these divisions and to campaign for their ideas. And that to any attempts to suppress such platforms would be unhealthy and undemocratic and fruitless. And events were to prove this true. The revisionists continued in secret and built their forces in the party bureaucracy, the trade unions, officials, and the SPD parliamentary delegation. Now compare Luxembourg's approach to that of Lenin. Lenin took a very different point of view and not necessarily driven by ideology because they, they were all moving into new situations. But Lenin instinctively uh, understood the need to organize the left as a faction within the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, Russian Social Democracy. And the Bolsheviks, the faction that he led, despite strong pressures at various times to disband, he kept the faction going. And through that was able to win the leadership of Russian Social Democracy for a revolutionary position in 1910. Now, luckily for him, he was helped by the Tsarist state machine which reimposed re repression in 1907, leaving only Lenin's faction willing to carry on and build the party. Meanwhile in Germany, the growing strength of the revisionist wing started to be reflected in parliament with the SPD delegation voting for some of the imperialist measures and militaristic budgets. And that's how this figure Karl Liebknecht, who's the son of the party's founder, Wilhelm Liebknecht, 
he emerged to protest against these moves. Now, there was reaction within the party. Um, elections were, were held within the party in 1907. And Luxembourg traveled around the country, winning lots of support for the, for the left um, from SPD audiences. Um, and there were demands for her to become a candidate for parliament. And there were demands for the left to become organized. But again, she rebuffed both, both of these, uh, these moves. Um, she continued to hold on to this line against factions. And she carried this, this line into in, international circles. So at the 1907 Socialist International Congress in Stuttgart, Luxembourg successfully moved, where, this was a very important Congress where Luxembourg successfully moved an amendment to the main resolution against the approaching world war. And this committed the international to turn any war into a class war with the aim of revolutionary overthrow of the aristocrats and the capitalists who created it. The motion was seconded by Lenin. And as a result of this, uh, they held a private meeting with a number of other left people at the Congress, in which Lenin proposed that they form a left fraction within, within the Second International. Again, consistently, Luxembourg re rejected the idea, so it fell. Imagine what a significant difference such a movement could have made in the light of what was to come seven years later. Now, now, now I come on to the First World War. 1914, the, the war broke out. I don't have time to go into the ins and outs of this, but to, to cut a long story short, the SPD parliamentary delegation in the Reichstag, reflecting its increasingly reformist line, decided by a majority to vote to finance the German war effort, or effort. And this came as a complete shock to the left throughout the world. Uh, Lenin couldn't believe it. In Germany itself, Luxembourg and Clara Zetkin admitted in their private diaries that both of them contemplated suicide. But quickly, they, uh, they gathered their spirits together and they formed the Internationalists, a group including Leo Jodic, uh, Paul Levy, Ernest Mayer, Franz Mehring, and Clara, Clara Zetkin, and of course, Karl Liebnick, who's, who came on to play a very important role as a parliamentary deputy. And they started to publish a paper called, called Spartacus, Spartacus, which is why they, get, they, they became to be known as the Spartacus group. Unfortunately, though, this was the worst time to form a left faction. Rather than form it at the time in peacetime, uh, many years before, when they had, would have had a chance to build up their forces, to, build, to launch it in wartime when there was, was a rigid censorship and repression, it was extremely difficult for them, for example, to even get out their, 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 their political line to their supporters. And, and it made it extremely difficult for them to build the movement. But nevertheless, they did fight bravely to do that. Now, every four months, the war credit vote came up again. And the next vote towards the end of 1914, Liebnick, Karl Liebnick, broke ranks with the SPD delegation and publicly opposed the war. Um, in nine, and as a result of that, he became seen as the, the leader of the anti-war movement. The following year, a very significant event happened where a sizable left group of SPD members of parliament broke from the parliamentary delegation and started to vote against the war. And in, in response, were expelled from the main delegation. So they formed what was called the SAG, the Socialist uh, Workers Group, and Working Group, and asked Rosa and Karl to join them. And here again, the Spartacists made a major sectarian mistake. Uh, for what they refused to do was to join a united front. By, by refusing to join the SAG or, or to work closely with them, they refused to join a united front against the war. And their argument was that they would only do so if the SAG accepted their full line against the war. But of course, the whole idea of a united front is that you, that you don't necessarily all agree, but you come together for concrete actions to fight uh, some struggle. In, in this case, obviously, the, the central struggle of fighting the war. Now, we can understand, of course, it's easy for us to talk, sit here and talk about these things. Because can you imagine a situation where your comrades were dying on the front every day? And the feelings uh, and the, the hatreds and uh, resentments that existed within the SPD uh, to the leadership of the SPD for having gone along with this slaughter. So you can understand the, the anger there was in it. But anger, it's a mistake to allow anger to dictate one's political tactics. And the results of the Spartacists sectarian mistake was both one to weaken the anti-war movement, which was a big mistake, and politically for the future to isolate the Spartacists and make them much more vulnerable. 
and, 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 and this made it much easier for um, the regime to enforce repression on the Spartacists. And very soon afterwards, Liebnik was arrested and sent to the front, and Rosa was arrested and spent the rest of the war in prison, which cut her off from the movement, tragically. Now, in 1917, um, the, the, this group of uh, dis socialist dissidents um, eventually formed the independent socialists. Um, I can't go into the details of what happened, but they, they, they parted ways with the main SPD and formed a large party on their, on their own right called the independent socialists, short, USPD for short. Now, Liebnik and Rosa were invited to serve on the national leadership of this body, but again, they did not accept the offer. And the result was that the Spartacists lost their leadership of the anti-war movement to this party, to the USPD. So when we come to the end of the war, the Spartacists emerge in a very pitiful state with less than 200 comrades across the whole of Germany. And at the end of the war, they compounded their mistake. They, they were invited, I mean, amazingly, uh, uh, as soon as the regime fell from power, a, a socialist government, uh, uh, socialists to put it in, in inverted commas, if you like, formed the government with uh, three, three um, commissars, as they call themselves, imitating the Russians, uh, three commissars from the SPD and three commissars from the USPD, the Independent Socialist Democrats. And the USPD asked uh, Liebnik to be one of those ministers. Now, there could be an argument about whether one should have taken that position. I personally think that Liebnik could have used that position tremendously, but he didn't. But what was ridiculous was that they were invited to sit on the new... Berlin Soviet executive, and they refused to do that the, unless the executive excluded the SPD, which was a ridiculous demand, and totally contrary to the way the Bolsheviks approached the Soviets in Russia, where they recognized that the Soviets had to represent all the forces on the left movement. And, and as a result of this, um, and, I, and I, I would like to, if I have time, to go into actually what happened following this, but as a result of this, um, I think the Spartacists missed their chances of emerging as the uh, key figures in the, the post-war movement. Uh, and I think the lesson for, for us here, for the future, is that on the one hand, um, obviously we, we've got to recognize that there's going to be, in any mass party of the workers, there's going to be different trends. And one of those trends is going to be a reformist. So for people come forward and ask that all the, all the, all the right wing should be expelled from the Labour Party, I think that's a bit of an unrealistic demand uh, and, 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 and what we should be doing is politically defeating them and re removing them from their leading positions. And on the other side, uh, we've got to be very careful um, not to, be, to take a sectarian line where we put our differences with other elements of the left to the fore and, and miss the chance that a united front action can take in moving the, forward, the movement forward and giving us a key voice in that movement. So I'd like to leave it at that. Thanks very much, comrades. Thank you very much, Pat. That was fascinating. Um, just a quick point. I mean, Karl Liebknecht uh, refused to join a government that ended up killing him as well. There's <laughs> that little point, but I'll leave that for later. Um, Ben's going to speak 20, 25 minutes, and then we're going to open up for uh, questions from the floor. If you want to speak, can you please press the button um, that says raise hand, the blue hand coming up, and then I can take you uh, more or less in the order of what you're indicating. So there's Ben. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks, comments. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks also to Pat, who uh, took on a lot of uh, material there, a lot of uh, history. Um, some of which I'll call into question, but I think I'll leave that for now because uh, I kind of want to pick up where he uh, left off in some ways, uh, which is which is, is quite helpful for the meeting, I hope. Um, and really, I'd like to take a step back uh, from the, the the events of the German Revolution, offer a few more uh, kind of general reflections on it. Not easy, again, to do in 20 minutes, but I'll do my best and also be able to answer any questions or clarify any points. Um, I want to do three things, really. Uh, first, uh, discuss the significance of the, the German Revolution to, to the left, its location in history and why it's, it matters, why it still matters. Secondly, I want to pick up on some of the things that Pat mentioned at the start, posing some good questions about the, the far left's narrative hitherto on 1918, 19 and beyond, and, and highlight some of the shortcomings and, in my view, simplifications that I've found. And finally, in, in the kind of critical spirit 
that uh, uh, Pat proposed when learning from some of the best and brightest of our movement historically. I want to take a, a kind of zoom in then, as it were, to um, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, political strategic thought um, just after where Pat left off, actually. So in, in, in early uh, 1919, when she was writing uh, and speaking to the program of the, uh, uh, of the, the, the Uncommunist Party, in January 1919, in, a, in an article called uh, What Does the Spartacus League Want? Um, and, and offer some critical thoughts on that and why I think there are lessons uh, there, but mainly perhaps of a, of a negative nature, if that makes sense. So let's start with the significance of it. It should be clear um, that the significance of the German Revolution to us, it really stems from the fact that at least when it came to Bolshevism, we have to bear in mind that their revolution of October 1917 in, in their own view was actually a rather modest thing. Uh, it was a contribution towards the project of world socialism uh, and little more than that actually because at the time, uh, and this changed later on with the rise of Stalinism, but at that time no serious Marxist thought that it would be possible for socialism to be built within Russia itself and so the Russian Revolution was merely to provide the spark uh, for the European Revolution in general and the German Revolution in particular for the reasons that Pat outlined the strength of the German movement. Just to get an impression of that is a quote from Karl Radek on the response of the Russian masses to news of revolution in Germany. He says, from every corner of the city, demonstrations were marching towards the Moscow Soviet. Tens of thousands of workers burst into wild cheering. Never have I seen anything like it again. Until late in the evening, workers and Red Army soldiers were filing past. The world revolution had come. The mass of the people had heard its iron tramp. Our isolation was over. So, those of you here last week, as, as Lars Lee explained last week, where, last week, whereas Lenin and other Bolshevik leaders have previously kind of looked west and indeed spent much of their lives living there in order to emulate the mass Marxist parties of the Second International and the homeland, Germany in, in particular, the October Revolution of 1917 kind of reversed this relationship with partisans in Germany and Western Europe more generally seeking to do what the Russians did, obviously much to the horror of the military, industrial and political elite, and of course, as Pat alluded to, the leaders of German social democracy and the trade union uh, bureaucracy in Germany. In retrospect, of course, there's something rather tragic about Radek's words alluded to by Tina in her introduction. The German Revolution did not succeed. It proved to be a failure. The siege on Russia was not broken. The Russian Revolution degenerated. Socialism in one country, the German working class brutally uh, uh, crushed. The Second World War, uh, the Holocaust, etc., etc. So we need to bear this in mind when thinking back. And I, I, I appreciate the critical uh, uh, spirit uh, uh, that, that Pat presented in his discussion. Um, you know, we're looking at people who pay often pay the most ultimate price for their for their commitment to the working class, and we need to uh, uh, be wary of, the, of not only of their heroism, their bravery, but also try, with the benefit of hindsight, as it were, to see what exactly happened and what went wrong. For while this revolution did bring enormous changes and in many ways far better conditions for the struggle for socialism than were present under the Kaiser. We have to be wary of that. It obviously did not succeed as the, the next contribution to the world revolution that began in October 1917. Now, of course, that might seem obvious, but I think it has important implications for what we should and what we should not uh, draw from this uh, incredibly important episode in, in our history. Okay, so this leads me on to section two, part two, um, looking at dominant far left narratives on 1918 to 1919 and the three kind of main problems I, I, I found with it in, in my research over the last 10 years or so. Um, first of all, I think there is an undue focus, an over emphasis, if you like, of the SPD's betrayal of the German Revolution at the expense of thinking seriously about how the SPD was actually able to get away with some of the horrible, murderous things that it did amongst the mass of the German population. So let me be clear here, I'm not saying that the German Revolution wasn't uh, uh, betrayed by social democracy, it clearly was, the memory of Luxembourg, Liebknecht and other murdered comrades speaks to this betrayal and should always serve as a warning for the future and indeed the present. Um, I think there's not enough thinking about how the SPD deployed its forces with both carrot and stick, as it were, and the fact that, you know, we have to bear this in mind, the party retained its mass support to such an extent throughout these events that it was able to co-opt and divert the revolution. In that sense, I, I think it was able to lead the revolution just in, uh, in the completely wrong direction. Um, 
And I think often on left wing accounts, that's forgotten. There's not really a serious accounting for the, the true balance of forces when we're talking about the events in 1918, 19, for example, where, as Pat alluded to, you have this tiny, uh, a, a brave and principled Spartacus organization with some uh, uh, friends in, and some influence in the broader movement. Uh, the SPD, a huge organization, and the recent left wing split from it, the USPD. It's the SPD, really, and the USPD that are pivotal, pivotal in it. Um, more generally, and I hear this a little bit in Pat's discussion, not in explicit, but sometimes I think this flows from a, a more general misunderstanding of the pre-1914 revolutionary history of the mass party of German social democracy and the strategic role it played both in the development of Bolshevism and the very best of the German revolutionary left too. I would also point out that I think it's misleading to argue that reformism in the, the SPD only begins to emerge in the 1890s or the 1880s um, and if anything the anti-socialist laws that Pat talked about facilitated the rise of performism it, 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 it's kind of the opposite effect because what the anti-socialist laws did they forbade all party organizations and meetings and publications except for the leadership so actually during the the anti-socialist laws we see real strong uh, uh, um, tendencies to reformism and the leadership riding roughshod, uh, roughshod over the uh, uh, um, over the membership because they're not in any way accountable, right? So I think that you know you look at the history of, of of the writings of Marx and Engels as early as the 1850s, 1860s. They are dealing with reformism, people trying to argue that we can have some kind of socialism through uh, uh, the Kaiserreich, uh, for example. So it's it's got a long a long history, um, but. To, to oversimplify for, for the purposes of time, I think one of the problems, and this is not so strong in, in what Pat just said, by the way, but generally on, on, on the far left, we see people, they tend to project backwards the anti-working class actions of the SPD leaders in 1914, as Pat pointed out, or in 1918 and beyond, as kind of the logical com culmination of, uh, of the perspectives in what Pat calls its formerly Marxist minimum program of 1891. Instead, actually, of seeing the, these actions in 1914 and 1918 as actually a break with uh, that Marxist, fundamental Marxist perspective. Again, I referred to Lars Lee's uh, point last week, on this forum, it's actually far more accurate to view the culminations of the SPD's original approach uh, for program, revolutionary social democracy, as culminating in Lenin and October 1917. That's a slightly different uh, uh, um, discussion, but I think it does play into this uh, uh, misunderstanding of the role played by the SPD, uh, and therefore not really understanding what was truly bad about the SPD leadership in 1918-19. Uh, I believe I'm one of the first to show uh, with translated documentary evidence, primary sources, et cetera. I'm happy to send it to, to comrades if they're interested. You know, exactly how leading social democrats, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the leading Marxist wing of social democracy, not just in Germany, but internationally, such as Karl Kautsky, how they broke with uh, and reneged upon their erstwhile commitments to revolutionary social democracy when it came to 1918 and 19. I can't go into that now, uh, but it's something I've written quite a lot on and could be of interest to comrades. Second problem I find with the left on, on Germany 1919, 18, 19, is that it tends to simplify uh, uh, rather superficially the strategic choices between reform and revolution in 1918, 19, by reducing them to some kind of binary of Soviet democracy on the one hand, which is good generally, and parliamentary democracy on the other, which is bad generally. And all I could say to that is, if only things were that simple, we probably uh, you know, wouldn't be having this meeting about the German revolution, the world would probably look rather different. Um, this view, of course, overlooks the obvious fact that, as in Russia, it was not the councils of the Soviets themselves that actually proved decisive, but it was rather developments within and developments pertaining to the strength of the political parties working inside them. In, German, in Germany's case, uh, largely for bad, the SPD and the USPD. 1914 to 1918, as I've said, the SPD remained the majority party in the working class, and as such, it was able to win most of the workers and social councils to its outlook and thus neuter their potential power with ease. There was obviously some, some exceptions to that violence was employed as well. Alongside that, fundamentally, they were able to control things from the get-go. Um, and the whole thing that, the, 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 again, a slight disagreement with Pat on, the, on this, the whole thing about the, SP, the SPD, USPD, provisional government was basically 
a kind of caretaker government to hand over, hand back power uh, to the bourgeoisie, to the capitalist state. I do think, for all my criticisms of Liebknecht and Luxembourg, which I'll discuss below, and some of which I actually share with Pat, I think it was absolutely fundamentally correct to reject participating in the USPD, SPD uh, uh, coalition caretaker government, if you like, from November to January, uh, which, you know, basically at, at its first uh, point of order when it first met these six commissars, again, using the terminology of the Russian Revolution but actually undermining it, the first thing they talked about was how to contain the Russian Revolution and what the German forces were going to do about it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that was a correct uh, decision on the part of the, of the Spartacist comrades. SPD then involved in a kind of dual strategy and Janus faced approach on the one hand organizing in the workers movement movement and the soldiers movement using the sheer force of numbers that it has its 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 weight in the working class its reputation in the working class its publications blah 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 uh, and it is able and we have to get our heads around this as well it is able to offer some substantial and historically significant reforms okay it gets rid of the three class voting system in prussia democratizes Prussia, kind of breaks it up a little bit too. It grants uh, women the right to vote and stand for election for the very first time, a huge uh, gain. Uh, concedes the eight hour day, which coming out of the, back, the backdrop of the, of the First World War, rationing all the rest of it is a huge uh, deal. On the other hand, as I've alluded to, using the language of the Russian Revolution, etc. at the same time, it's doing deals with the German high command, uh, attempting to disarm the council movement, repressing the Bolshevik revolution in the east, et cetera, et cetera, and then Finland and other places. Um, so this this double strategy, and I think we have to uh, um, uh, be wary of that in, in order to locate precisely what the SPD uh, was doing here. Just on the SPD, USPD, caretaker government as well, what's interesting to note, and I go into this in some detail in my book on the Halle Congress of the USPD, the USPD representatives, what we, you know, commonly be known as centrist, not, not uh, far leftist by any uh, uh, stretch of the imagination. They just have enough, of, uh, they just had enough of the SPD's treatment of the Bolshevik, uh, sorry, of the council movement in Germany, of the fact that they're uh, playing games with crushing, crushing movements, uh, uh, starting provocations and, uh, and all the rest of it, but they leave, they actually leave before the, uh, 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 the government actually had wind up its business and leaving just the SPD. And again, I think that was, that was a principal move. The third problem I locate in the, the far left narrative of 1918-19 is that the significance of some of the strategic issues post, posed by the, the events between uh, 1918 and 1923, um, this, the downplaying of the significance of these issues often kind of creates the impression that if only the Spartacist League or the German Communist Party, which let's remember, only really became a real party in late 1920 when it fused with the, the opposition of the independent social democracy, the USPD. If only this small group had avoided this tactical mistake or blunder, and trust me, there were plenty of them, boycotting the National Assembly elections in January 1919, for example, the first time women can vote and be elected in, in Germany. Um, huge mistake. But if only they'd avoided these mistakes, then maybe, you know, um, with, with the right decisions, they could have kind of successful uh, and I think that that is also an, an illusion because we have to make it clear that the, Ger the, the German Communist Party even though it did it did grow substantially was never the majority party of the German working class let alone German society um, and so to, to imply that okay with the, with the right decisions in 1918-19 for example this tiny organization could have led things along and really grown and blossomed I think is, is, is simplistic and misleading I'm not saying uh, that the revolution was was impossible, and I'm not saying that the uh, the blunders made by the the young KPD uh, didn't uh, kind of hinder their cause, because clearly the German Communist Party did grow, but it did take uh, a long time to do so, and um, there was always, as I'll go on to discuss now, the idea that a, a small organisation can bring about revolution was a problem for the KPD. Um, I think actually that the, the real uh, the concerning thing about this is that it can this idea that a small group in in times of revolutionary upheaval can balloon all of a sudden and, and then t take hold of the masses overnight uh, away from the existing organizations that have been around for 30 40 years uh, it kind of still feeds into uh, left-wing uh, strategic thought today with implying that small groups working in broad left organizations as long as they you know they, they have the the uphold their exclusively correct transitional approach to the demands and struggles of the masses can suddenly uh, you know, blossom and, and lead the workers to power. And I think that, that
that is an illusion and that is shown by uh, uh, by Germany 1918-19 as Pat again kind of alluded to in terms of the, the fate of the Spartacus uh, uh, League. Or now we come on to part three for whatever my criticism of Rosa Luxemburg as a thinker are and they are they are many one absolutely fundamental thing which she upheld uh, against this idea is that the socialist transformation of society can only be and this is clear in, in all of her writings and particularly in her programmatic writings on that discussed can only be the conscious act of the majority of the population uh, like Lenin uh, despite some, some uh, a strange discussion about this last week, she did not place her faith in, in coups. Um, she she recognised that uh, a socialist revolution requires the conscious act of the majority. Now, for me, there is no uh, uh, natural form of, of, of revolution. It could be prompted by mass strikes, military collapse in rebellion, as in Germany, revolutionary parties winning a huge vote, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But what matters fundamentally is the radical democratic republican content underlying the regime. That's what I've, I've written about as well in, in various places. Marx and Engels called this the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economic emancipation of labour. Or to quote Engels again, if one thing is certain, it is that our party and the working class can only cope with the power under the form of a democratic republic. It's building on this idea of, of a revolution as a conscious act of the majority. And as I say, right to her final days, the two days before she was killed, uh, uh, Luxembourg upholds this position. Uh, and it's worth mentioning two things in this regard. Um, in, uh, in, in January 1919, I just mentioned the one, in January 1919, uh, there is a, uh, an attempt by a revolutionary committee in which Karl Liebknecht is involved. Uh, to seize power in Berlin, and when and he kind of does that behind the back of the uh, uh, the KPD leadership, and famously Luxembourg turns to him when she hears this, and she's absolutely furious with with him, and she says, "Is that our program, Carl?" This is again a, a, a massively important aspect of her legacy, because the fact is that even though Berlin could fall, and in Berlin there was there was huge support for this, and it would it would happen. Everybody knew, and certainly Luxembourg knew, that across the country itself, this was not going to be a nationally coordinated thing. Uh, there was not uh, sufficient support for this movement uh, uh, across the country. She also mentions, Pat talked about uh, uh, proletarians and peasantry in Germany. She also mentions the fact that, as of yet, the revolution has not penetrated the minds of the peasants in Germany. And that's a, that's a substantial uh, uh, part of the population, even in 1918, 1919. Um, and she, you know, she's fully aware of these things that, you know, it, this is dangerous, this is playing, this is kind of putschism, and it will not serve uh, uh, the interests of the revolution. In the end, it's kind of been decided, she goes along with it, and it sets in, chain the motion, it sets in motion the chain of events that, that leads to her, to her murder. Um, and one of the things I, I point out is that this, this whole, pro this is a problem that besets the German revolution from the outset. There's two parts to it. It's not just that the German revolution was uh, uh, coordinated and, and brought about on its own terms within the borders of Germany, independently of some of the other uprisings in Hungary, etc. That that's one problem in and of itself. But if you look at the the, the kind of really bizarre unfolding of events from from uh, the collapse of the regime, the military regime, through to the uh, the elections. Um, there's very little coordination across it. So Bavaria is the first to go, and Bavaria declares a government all in its own away from everyone else. You have Berlin, and then you know, later on you have the March action uh, in central Germany, which is where, uh, the again, a, a small minority action attempts to launch power, leads to huge repression, people killed, people arrested. The, the KPD lead, uh, membership just you know, is almost halved. And, and so it is, it is a problem that, uh, that constantly uh, besets the, uh, uh, the KPD throughout its existence. And particularly the March action of 1921 undid the good work that it done in I mean, a mass party, uh, primarily through um, uh, its orientation towards uh, the USPD. Again, you can see the head to head in Haller's book about that. There's a more fundamental problem, though. this is my last point on, on Luxembourg, if we take a closer look at the program of the KPD, which she wrote in January 1919, um, which I would recommend comrades uh, should do, we find that their sole focus as a political organisation is on the workers and socials councils as the alternative to the emerging Weimar constitution. There's a problem with this, though, because not only is it uh, quickly overtaken by events, i.e. the council system is, is, is dissolved, sometimes bloodily within a couple of months, 
but it's also and this feeds into the problem of them boycotting the national assembly elections in 19 january 1919 it's also kind of aloof to and separate from some of the most important uh, 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 struggles of the time which is you know germans having the right to vote on their future and the KPD do not enter this uh, uh, this election uh, uh, struggle, and it, it, it obviously is a, a, a huge uh, mistake. But it's, for me, it's not just a tactical mistake; it's embedded in the strategic uh, uh, outlook of, of the KPD at this time. Clara Zetkin, who was a close comrade of uh, of, of uh, Rosa Luxemburg, he, she was actually elected in the local elections in 1919 uh, to a local state parliament as a USPD member. So she didn't originally join the KPD, and she expresses her concerns to uh, to Rosa Luxemburg about this boycotting of the elections. And Luxemburg says, "This is a response." She says, "In reality, the rush of events has put the question of participating in the National Assembly on the back burner, and if things continue in this way, it is highly doubtful whether there will be elections on the National Assembly." Well, there were elections. There was a National Assembly, uh, and there was a big turnout for the SPD. Women turned out, I think, in about eighty-five percent. It was huge turn out an important struggle and there was no independent working class uh, uh, voice there. You know, USPD left, of course, people like Clara Zetkin, but the communists were, unab were unable to uh, uh, put their the, the program forward. This was a serious uh, misjudgment of the immediate situation at long-term ramifications. With Luxembourg even arguing now that the minimum program of revolutionary social democracy, I, along the lines of the effort program of the SPD in 1891, the conditions on which a socialist party would take power in the form of the democratic republic she now argued that this be liquidated for her and with the wages slogan down which the wages system was the slogan of the hour as were calls for the german united socialist republic and the task of seriously setting about destroying capitalism clearly if we look at the balance of forces at the time with the benefit of hindsight the revolution with working class was still some way from political power and not in a position uh, to do so now luxembourg the brilliance she was clearly responding in a brave and revolutionary way to the skullduggery uh, of the social democratic leaders that i've discussed in abusing terms such as the democratic republic the minimum program as kind of fig leaves for their bloody restoration of the capitalist order but i would argue that she nonetheless threw the baby out with the bathwater, leaving the young kpd with very little strategically besides supporting strikes and demonstrations as supposedly the ex external form of the struggle for socialism now she dies we'll never know exactly how she would have responded to the new political situation all you can say is that the kpd itself under the leadership of one of again a, a close friend and comrade of hers paul levy did recognize that the situation had changed and it was only when levy started orientating uh, uh, towards the presence for the party, standing in elections, having a presence, but also orientating forces towards the, the radicalizing USPD left, that the KPD uh, became an organization that could start to impose itself, still a long way from uh, uh, the, the, the kind of size of social democracy, but not that far, you know, 200,000 members or something by uh, after the fusion with the, uh, uh, with the USPD left in, in 1920. Obviously, what happens there, I, I can't go into, but I would say that the, 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 the kind of spectre of putschism is something that continually haunts it and leads it to bleeding members on, on a regular basis. But um, yeah, I think I will stop there, gone into some detail about the, the programmatic debates in 1918-19, and hopefully that's been of use. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, I should say that anybody who wants to speak, could you please click... Um, raise your hand or raise hand so that's a in order to make you into a panelist um you will have to come on here i will ask you then to start your camera and here's alan he's the first he's sitting in front of something very strange <laughs> that looks cool though I'm there, you go. there you go what is that alan that is a zoom background mass ranks of the proletariat or um people standing outside um, the election results in Wellington in the 1930s, ah. Wellington, New Zealand. But it was the most political one I could find from their selection. Uh, okay, that was very interesting. Thanks very much uh, to the two speakers. Um, I think that uh, what um, Ben was saying about quite often those on, this left, on the left will simply look to the betrayal of the SPD and not look at uh, what might have been done differently and to what extent 
uh, there were bad choices and tactics made by the revolutionaries. Um, I think that Pat was also um, looking at that question as well. And I think that in terms of lessons we might learn, looking at that is perhaps more easy, it's more useful because it's very easy just to blame uh, the uh, bad reformists for doing what bad reformists do. Um, so, yeah, just what Don kind of boiling that down to one simple thing. Um, uh, what Ben was talking about at the end there. Um, the KPD program, uh, which has its sole focus on workers' councils. Um, I would agree that's a mistake. Um, boycotting the elections, I would agree that was a mistake. Uh, but I wasn't clear on what uh, Ben was suggesting as an alternative. Um, because there are two potential alternatives there in what you said, Ben. Um, that because you talked about the importance of what to describe it as the radical Republican democratic program, it might be interpreted that you were arguing that a fo that the focus should have been on um, the democratic republic um, to the extent that existed, looking to the um, progressive reforms which you pointed the SPD government passing, uh, that these are real gains. Um, and which seem to posit that in, in, a, in a sense of um, a, a progressive program uh, still being manifest within the SPD, as opposed to uh, perhaps an alternative narrative, which is that uh, these were necessary concessions because of the revolutionary uh, movement. Um, because I'd, I'd argue in terms of the KPD program, having a sole focus on workers' councils is um, uh, left-wing communist deviation, but certainly the primary focus sh should be on workers' councils. The, the need to um, pose um, what would be the, what is the different form of proletarian democracy to that of bourgeois democracy to, uh, to emphasize uh, the elements in um, that question which are outlined in Lenin's State and Revolution, I think is very important. But then has to be primary. Obviously that is, if you do that in an exclusive way and what is essentially a left communist way to exclude yourself from the um, main actions of the, of the bulk of the working class, then that's a sectarian response. So I'm interested in when, what Ben thinks. Would he agree that, that the Workers' Council's orientation should, should be the primary focus? or should it be some kind of uh, left radical democratic republicanism? And one other point, and then I'll finish, is the, I thought Pat's um, narrative was quite convincing in terms of what I understood him arguing was the central issue um, or in Rosa Luxemburg's political weaknesses within her overall um, greatness. Um, in terms of the revolution was that she had not seen the need to organize separately um, as a revolutionary current and had indeed had argued against that and turned down opportunities to do that as Pat um, outlined. Um, I think that that's clearly um, a major problem as, we, as was discussed um, in last week's session, that's one of the central lessons that is learned by uh, Lenin the need for separate political organization and where necessary organizational separation of the revolutionary current as revolutionaries because it will not be a party um, of the whole class. It will not be an SPD or um, the social democratic parties which um, were understood by everybody pre-World War I, which will lead the revolution. That that lesson is a lesson that's learned by Lenin and Lenin and it's a lesson that's learned negatively in this case by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebmerks and the Spartacist groups uh, reluctance to do that. And you can see that sectarianism uh, towards, well, it's not sectarianism, it's something else. You see that weakness, which is actually a flip side of sectarianism. So when they're forced to act, they do so in a sectarian way. And I think that if um, Rosa Luxemburg and the other leaders which were to come to form the Spartacist League had had that perspective earlier, 
then they would have had some of the training and would have been a strong organisation so that when it came to break, Ben's right that they do it, did it too late, um, they would have had a greater, a greater chance of success because they would have had a tempered organisation. So I think that Pat's right strategically um, and while Ben is right tactically about the particular um, issues of the KPD program and the uh, boycott and the elections and I'd also agree with him on not joining the SPD USP government. Um, I'm still not sure what he thinks about the question of what should have been the primary focus of that KPD program in terms of proletarian versus bourgeois democracy. Finish. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, we've got quite a few people indicating already, seven or eight. Um, could you please try to stick to about three minutes? I will wind you up then. Um, and also, if I ask you to, uh, if you want to speak, you need to switch on your camera. Um, so, Michelle, um, I would like to take you after Norman. So, if you then could uh, switch on your camera. I'm unmuting you now, Norman. There you are. Oh, you've muted yourself again. <laughs> You can hear? <laughs> yes, good. Yeah, yes, thanks very much to the uh, two speakers who brought uh, to my attention events that I, to be honest, know very little about, but uh, certainly got me interested and I shall be doing some reading on this. But one question I'd like to put to uh, both the speakers is about the role of the, the military in these um, revolutionary events, particularly during the First World War. And as we know, the, um, the, the Russian army uh, mutinied on the front and that was a major factor in bringing about the success of the revolution in Russia. Um, can, you, can the speaker say anything about the, the role of the military in, 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 in Germany? Um, presumably they were leaders on the Russian side and the military on the Russian side who led these mutinies and um, may, uh, turned them into a major factor. But um, were there similar leaders in, in the, uh, on the German side? And did anything happen actually uh, in the way of a mutiny in, in the German army? Um, uh, during, during the First World War, particularly in the 1917 period. Thanks, Norman. Um, ben and Pat, I suggest I take two, three more people before I get back to you, yes? Okay. Um, Michelle, I still can't uh, get you. I can't, I can't call you in. Um, so I'm calling in uh, Emil now and unmute you. Hello, Emil. Hi there. Um, I have, uh, oh, thanks uh, again for both uh, uh, speakers uh, uh, for that uh, talk. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, both speakers uh, mentioned that Rosa is uh, quite misunderstood, uh, not only because of her book on reform and revolution, but also I believe on her work on the uh, mass strike, um, which the far left today has inherited. Uh, much of this type of uh, strategy. Um, <clears throat> that is the strategy of trying to rile up the masses, uh, trying to force the question of power via strike action, via uh, setting up councils of action, etc. Um, what I would like to hear from the speakers uh, is their view um, of the strategy of patience, as it was uh, called uh, at the time. Um, so Luxembourg stood in this tradition, I believe. Um, so it is relevant for this, this type of discussion, I think. Um, what I believe uh, the strategy to mean uh, starts with Marx's point uh, that working class has to take political action themselves as a class, as a collective. Um, so what the early SPD did in this period, and I'm talking about from basically their founding in 1875 until the First World War, uh, was to build up great societies uh, within existing society. Um, so during the so-called uh, so socialist laws, the repression laws, uh, they built up their own postal service, which uh, apparently ran more efficient than the official state uh, uh, postal service. Um, they had hundred, hundreds of thousands of people organized in trade unions, uh, workers' cooperatives, uh, so, so social societies like bicycling uh, clubs. Um, there was even in the 1920s uh, a big workers' olympiad uh, coming out of this movement uh, where hundreds of thousands of people were participating uh, within, within these games. Um, 
lastly spoke last week and he wrote a lot on this subject. So I'll just keep it brief. And my question basically is what would this strategy mean um, for the left today uh, in the Labour Party in, in England? I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I believe this question to be relevant in uh, at least the working class for Western Europe, if not uh, broader than that. Uh, so I would like to hear both uh, speakers on that subject. Thank you. Sorry, thanks, Emil. I'm bringing in Peter Kennedy next. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hi there. Uh, thanks for your talk, um, Ben and Pat. Really enjoyed that. Great. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, there's been an, an emphasis quite rightly on politics and, um, yes, um, SDP and the revisionism and the revolutionary contest that went on in this p particular period of time that you're talking about. Um, and I wonder, you know, the, you know, the idea of revolution is posited and it has been a revolutionary situation. My reading of a revolution is something of a longer process whereby workers' consciousness, political consciousness, is, is the key factor in a transition towards another society. Um, you know, we have to seize power, i.e. the working class has to seize power, and it has to be organised to do that. But the seizure of power is, is not the, the, the end of the revolution, it's merely the beginning of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, in, in all the shenanigans of that time, as you described them so well, where the working class were at politically, because we hear a lot about the leaders, you know, the uh, imputed leaders of the, of the working class, and um, I've got every respect for Luxembourg. And I, I obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but I do favour here and the, the left over the um, STP. But it seems to me that um, I asked myself a number of questions. One is about the, the revolutionary consciousness of the working class. Two is um, whether too much time was spent by the left trying to gain some sort of ascendancy within the SDP. When it seems to me that um, quite early on, um, and soon after Engels died, you say, it was, um, it was well ensconced within the developed forms of capitalism within Germany even though it had been defeated in war and it was in, in the interwar years of this crisis, it was still nevertheless the, one of the most developed um, forms of capitalism on the planet at the time, organised into cartels. Uh, Hilferding wrote about finance capital as being the highest form, then he came from Germany at that time. Obviously, he was part of the SDP as well, the centrist movement there. Um, but I, I'm thinking that this party is well ensconced. Do we spend... Did, did the left spend far too much time and, and hence leave it too late, um, focused on trying to win some sort of ascendancy at the expense of like looking at the working class and seeing whether after going into a war, you know, are a working class in a healthy state, in a revolutionary healthy state, to have the confidence to go into a brand new society called socialism? Or were they, were they more... Uh, at the level of maybe, you know, being fair prey to those who are working towards a kind of state capitalism, which is, you know, for me, a mutant, mutant form of, of um, the enterprise of socialism. So I think about these things, and I, and I think about them a lot more when we emphasise leaders and the political factions and divorced, I think, from the possibly any attention towards the revolutionary content of working class consciousness. So anyway, thanks for that. Thank you. I think I'd better bring the two speakers in now. I think there's quite a lot for already, if that's okay with you, yeah. Pat, do you want to go first? And I'll unmute you. There you go. Oh, I've unmuted you <laughs> and you muted yourself again. <laughs> there you go. You. Oh no, I still can't hear you. Sorry, Pat, there's something wrong with your microphone. Can you unmute myself? Okay. There you are. That's good. Okay. All right. Hold on a second. I've got to cancel this. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, well, thanks, Ben, for the, your, your contribution. Um, some excellent points you made there, which I'd like to comment on. Um, 
I think you mentioned about the, the anti-socialist laws, and I hadn't heard that version of um, of uh, things. And it's certainly, I think, worth investigating to see whether, in fact, the illegality of the party encouraged uh, the opportunists, or, 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 or as I thought uh, in the past, um, that it actually discouraged them. And I have seen examples that when the when the SPD was formed in 1875. Before it became uh, illegal, uh, one of the things that, that Engels complained about and Marx was about all these middle class professors who were suddenly attracted to the party because it was being successful and gaining votes. And then, of course, uh, he, he talks rightfully about, how, uh, rightfully about how they disappeared as soon as the uh, party became illegal. You know? <laughs> so I, I'd always had that idea. And in fact, when you look at it, um, it was only after the... Um, the party was effectively made legal in 1890 that you start to see the uh, serious revisionist wing develop. I mean, after all, it's only, it's 1896, uh, only a few years after that, where they come out into the open and, um, and so on. So I, I think there's a, an argument to be had there. This is certainly a thing that we, we could look at further. Um, when uh, when uh, Ben also talked about how the SPD broke with its revolutionary history by what it did in the First World War and at the end of the war, and that, I agree with that entirely. But that, after all, it was the reason why Bernstein was called a revisionist. You know that he was revised, trying to revise the the, so, the socialist revolutionary history of the party. Um, now Ben made a very good point also on the. Um, the KPD's boycott of the 1919 national election, which I think I thought was ridiculous. And one of the strange things that happened was, and, and I don't agree, um, one of my criticisms of uh, Spartacists was that I think they made a big mistake about the whole founding of the Communist Party. Because they had the opportunity, in my view, to actually win the leadership of the independent socialists. Uh, and I can go into more details about that. And I think it, the point was proved uh, not long, about 18 months later, where the independent socialists joined the Communists anyway. Um, but the sad thing about the formation of the Communist Party was that the elements who made up of it were ultra-left. And to the shock of the leadership of the uh, Spartacists, they lost the control of the conference. They lost the, the platform that was agreed by the conference was ultra-left, not to work in unions, not to, work, uh, to participate in, in elections, and so on. And uh, they argued, um, Paul Levy and Luxembourg and so on, Josic, they argued strongly against these positions, but they lost the conference and um, there's a reason lots of reasons for, to go into that but the reality was that the the people who joined the communist party were in many cases either ultra left groups or were um, unemployed wor uh, workers or new people to the struggle who were not actually uh, experienced in the movement and all the best revolutionary workers had joined the independent socialists and the independent socialists had been the leadership of the revolutionary shop stewards committee now that that brings me on to a question that um, that someone else asked asked me about. Um, I think it was uh, Norman. Yes, Norman asked about the role of the military and uh, was there a mutiny in, Ger mutiny in Germany? Well, there was a big mutiny in Germany, which is why the war came to an end and the the whole regime fell. But that had been uh, that had been preceded by mass strikes organised by this revolutionary so shop stewards committee, which was in the independent socialists. And I think that that's um, one, one factor in why I, I think the, um, the Spartacists made a big tactical mistake about the independent socialists, but that's a longer discussion. Now, um, should the, the other question that was, taken, uh, that was raised by Ben, and I think that would probably take a lot of argument uh, one way or the other, we, we wouldn't know the answer, is should the Spartacists have taken up the offer of a commissar position in, in the caretaker government? Now, on the positive side, I think that um, this was actually a workers' government. It was three ministers from the SPD, three ministers from the independent SPD. So there were no capitalists in this government. And one could argue that Liebnik could have played a key role, not in changing, maybe winning these decisions there, but actually uh, emerging as a very powerful figure, a credible figure, as an alternative to what the government was doing. And also it would have made it difficult for them to use some of the government machine. But anyway, that's... But I think there's arguments to be had on this tactically. But where I, d I think they did make a terrible mistake, and definitely I don't think there's argument about, was not being willing to go into the leadership of the Soviet. And I think that, that, that brings me on to the question where Alan asked the question about, was there a potential for Soviets in Germany as a way to make the revolution? And I think there is an argument that there was. Um, one of the big problems you had was that the, 
you know, history moves on, doesn't it? And I, the, the German Social Democrats had learned from the experience of uh, Russia the year before. And they have obviously said to themselves, oh, shit, we mustn't allow Soviets to become powerful in Germany because that's how the, 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 the Bolsheviks were able to win power. And so you had a very conscious uh, leadership of the majority of the, 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 uh, the working class who were against Soviets, and that made it very difficult. But nevertheless, they, they were tackled. So they, in public, supported Soviets and participated in them. And the tragedy was that um, the Spartacists uh, were not, didn't play any role in that effectively by boycotting it. Um, now, th this brings me on to another point. Well, I'll, I'll save that to my summary at the end. Um, now, Alan did make a point, which I think maybe he's misunderstood what I was arguing for. I wasn't arguing for Rosa Luxemburg to separate from the SPD. On the contrary. I was arguing for Rosa Luxemburg to do what Lenin did, which was to organize a revolutionary uh, group within the SPD, as he had done within Russian social democracy, and to strive to win the majority leadership of the movement. Um, and now, uh, how far she could have got in that, we, we don't know. Um, I suspect uh, probably she couldn't have achieved that. But she, I think by being organized in advance, and also internationally, I think that would have been put them in a much better situation when the war broke out to oppose the war. And certainly, I think if they had um, joined forces with the independent social, social democrats, I think they could have even become the leadership of the independent social democrats. But that history, you know, we don't know. Um, strategy of patience. Emil talked about um, the strategy of patience. Well, if I can, if he asked you how it would relate to the present situation, well. For me, I think that there is a relevance here that um, there was nothing wrong with the German Social Democrats building in the community and building alternative forces in the community that were run by the workers. I think a very good model. I'm not sure, sure we can do that today to that extent, but I certainly think that we need, um, and I think most people accept that we were divorced from the, the mass, although we had, the Labour Party had five, 600,000 members. When you actually take that, take that as a percentage of the whole population, it's still small. And I think that if you look at the manifesto, it was quite clear that we had some fantastic policies in the manifesto, but the working, working people in Britain didn't even know what those policies were. They did, the, they did their opinion surveys of that and they found that to be the case. And that was a tragedy. So what I think we need to do is I think we need to um, participate in uh, massive campaigns on housing, on transport and so on, that reach across, not, that not party controlled campaigns, but where we play a key role within them but reach out into all the, uh, the working people so that actually they know what these policies are. They play the role in developing them. Uh, and I think that's a way to, to one of the ways that we can bridge the gap that we currently have between us and, and the, the rest of the community. Um, one thing was made, uh, Peter talked about, he asked a question, where were the workers at in this period? What was their moods? And of course, the, the trouble is that they changed it, uh, all the way through this. So. Um, at the beginning of the war, uh, a large section of the working class were in favour of the war. Um, we have to be realistic about that. There's stories about how when the SPD uh, deputies uh, were getting their trains to go to Berlin to vote on the war credits in August, September, um, they were besieged by workers uh, and all sorts of people uh, by the side of the trains, begging them to go there and vote for the war credits. And the reason, part of the reason was because they were lied to by the media, by the government, who pretended that Germany was under attack and came up with all these stories about how they had been bombed by the French and, and so on. So the, the workers felt that this was a defensive war. And of course, that was all part of their tactic. But then by the end of the war, um, I think the whole situation had dramatically changed. And there was, uh, there was mass starvation going on. Um, there had been huge amount of strikes at home. The, the workers on the front uh, had seen so many of their comrades died. They, they're bitter at the, uh, at the government, at the, uh, the generals, at the junkers, at the aristocrats who'd taken them to the war. And they were looking for a totally new uh, um, Germany. And that's why when uh, Karl Liebknecht leaped onto the um, balcony um, at the Reichstag and announced uh, that this was the beginning of the Socialist Republic, he got massive support forcing the uh, SPD leader to come out, uh, to come out and uh, declare the um, uh, Republic and the end of the, uh, end of the monarchy and so on. And I think that there was a, there was a massive mood where if the, if the leadership of the SPD had wanted to, they could have uh, led to, um, they could have themselves led a, a revolution, but of course they didn't want that. Now, was there a chance to, after that, to make a revolution? That's a long debate. 
and I, th I think that um, uh, certainly if the if the Spartacists had played the the, 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 the uh, acted sensibly and had won the leadership of the independent socialists, I think there would have been a chance. But when they they went and split from the uh, the rest of the socialist movement and formed this small communist party, which was ultra left, I think it became very very difficult. There were some opportunities later on. Um, but then uh, th th that's another story. But I think that, that those were the biggest opportunities that we missed. Thank you very Sorry much. Sorry if I've missed anybody well, else there. Well, you can always come back at the end. <clears throat> okay, Ben is next. I'll unmute you now. <laughs> Sorry, I've unmuted you <laughs> and you've muted you again. So, so there you go. Yep. Good. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, so a, a number of things. I, I must say that the, the there are a couple of things that, that what Pat said that I absolutely agree with. One that I don't, but I'll focus on later on. Uh, I think Alan kind of corrected himself anyway on this. You know, the the, the point I would stress, you know, and, and the, the factional stuff about organising the left as a faction in the SPD is not about uh, uh, splitting off into a, into a separate organ separate group. It's about organizing a faction. I think you, you've kind of recognized that anyway, and so, that, so that's fine. I will say this though, and this, this, is, the, this is the paradox. Well, this, this, there's a paradox within a paradox, so let's, <laughs> let's not get too deep. But, but the problem is that the, uh, to all intents and purposes, up to, until 1914, right? You could say until 1910, when uh, Lenin and others start to see problems in some of the things that Kautsky's writing. Rosa Luxemburg, for example, is very critical of, uh, of Kautsky on the mass strike question. Mays raises some good points against him, some not so good points against him. The Bolsheviks still generally go with Kautsky on this, although they make the, uh, they do. And there's a, an article that Lenin writes against uh, Kautsky's Dinoya tactic, the new tactics, uh, which says Kautsky here is making too many uh, uh, um, concessions to opportunism. But until that point, at least until 1910, for argument's sake, the the, the organization of Marxist social democracy is to all intents and purposes the leadership, <laughs> right? You've got the opportunist wing, the revisionist, Bernstein, etc. but the, the people set in the tone, and Luxembourg is, is part of that, she's critical, but the people set in the tone of the, of, the, of the party and its organization are the key people in the organization. August Babel, read Lenin on August Babel, he says he embodies everything that was brilliant about revolutionary social democracy. He dies in 1910, 11. Right. Um, and, and that's the paradox. So in a sense, I can understand. I've always made the point that the problem with German communism is that it's too early. Sorry, it's too late and it's too early. I'll explain that in a second. It's too late for the reasons I just alluded to and what Pat's been talking about. But in a sense, you know, the, 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 it's, it's not that there wasn't a need for an opposition until then, but it was being done by other people. The people raising the points at which the Bolsheviks, for example, were, uh, were making against the revision, etc., were largely made by people like Kautsky and Babel, who were kind of the figureheads of the SPD, right? The reason I think then the foundation of the German Communist Party is too early is precisely for the reasons that Pat quite eloquently put it now in, in his response, is that, you know, they did not, they should have had an orientation to the USPD leadership. Some of the best people in the KPD come from the USPD. I mentioned Clara Zetkin. She wants, kind of wants to join the KPD, but she can't because she's a candidate for the USPD, right? They, they clearly left that organization far too early. Uh, uh, they, and they were annoyed because they kept calling for a USPD Congress. And of course the leadership wouldn't give it. And they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll form our own group, right? Now, it's not that there aren't, what they wrote and some of the things I've looked at in terms of their early programmatic stuff isn't a value, both negative and positive, but clearly as a, as a, as a tactical judgment, in that case, it was wrong. The only time that, because they remain a small group, as you say, they pick up people uh, who are new to the movement, radicalized, and you can you can understand that radicalization because there's demonstrations are being shot at and the you know the meetings are being terrorized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But fundamentally, they do not have the experience or you know of, of the of the kind of old guard, the precisely the Marxist revolutionaries, the Marxist faction, if you like, of. Uh, uh, what came out of the SPD, right? The, the true left. I'm not talking about Kautsky here. He's 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 gone the, he's gone the other way by the, by the time he joins the SPD. But he, uh, sorry, the USPD. But there are a lot of uh, uh, rank and file members, as you say, the revolutionary Stropsheers. These were the the raw 
uh, material of the best parts of German communism. And the fact is that the, the, the split that they, they did when they did had little to no effect whatsoever. And people like Levy and later Luxembourg itself, they kind of realized that, right? Luxembourg thought, though, that the logic of events themselves would move things along. The National Assembly elections, well, you know, they'll kind of be blown away anyway. It doesn't matter. And I think that was a misjudgment, as, as I outlined in my, in my, in my opening. Um, do I think there was potential for the Soviets? My short answer is no, for the reasons I gave. It, fundamentally, the, the, the fate of these things depended on the forces behind them. And the majority force, to all intents and purposes, was the SPD, which had another agenda. And I think that's all we can say. There, there's always potential for working class organizations to go places. But as I said, it hinged on, you know, what were the forces involved? The SPD was by far dominant. If that had been the case four years later, you maybe can have an argument. But I think you know, in that last instance, I would just say answer that question in, in the negative. Um, quite frankly. Um, da, 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 da. So that leads me on to uh, some of the points Alan made. The first thing I want to say is that it, it, I'm going to call this, I, 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 I was thinking about this today, and I, I think I'm going to call it the far left flat earther society. That's my, my, my term for it now. This, this idea that the SPD, the party of Engels, Liebknecht, Zetkin, Luxembourg, people that we couldn't be fit to lick the boots of as revolutionaries, right, as stinkers, Right, their party, right, is somehow like the Labour Party, or is a party of the whole class. I, I, I just, I just think it, it is a bit like thinking that the Earth is flat from this, the perspective of, of, of far left politics. You know, look at all the evidence against it. Lenin was clear, right? You know, this is the party we need in Russia. These are the politics we need in Russia. We don't like the opportunists. We need to deal with the opportunists. There's a whole discussion about how we could and should have done that, right? But fundamentally, the, 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 the SPD is a completely different organization to the Labour Party. Uh, and I think that should be obvious from the people who have founded it, their ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's, that's the first point I'd like to make. The second question that Alan raised, I think, is, is a good one. OK, then. So if I'm saying that the, the let's say let's say the, 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 there should be some focus on the, on the Soviets. We, Alan and I agree while we're writing the program. Then the next two months happen and there are no Soviets, but pretty much. Well, what do we do? Clearly, then we need to focus our energies elsewhere. Ideally, we should have focused on the elections and, and putting across our, our ideas, etc. But, you know, I just see yeah, I've got my I've got my Lenin on this, you know, and uh, Lenin talk. I'm, I, what I'm saying is that the communists shouldn't have, uh, uh, as, as Luxembourg argued, ditch the minimum program, the minimum program is the basis by which the conditions on which the working class movement and the working class party will come uh, to power. Um, have I got it here? Yeah, this is just my Lenin. Um, I, might have to, I might have to come back with a quote, but basically Lenin in 1917, a few days before uh, the October Revolution, is saying it's absolutely ridiculous, as some comrades are proposing, like Bukharin, to ditch the, the minimum program. Oh, because we're not in power. And even if we are in power, right, we're still going to need it on some form because we might be overthrown. He, he basically says, until the World Socialist Revolution is successful, we need the minimum program. We need our ideas for how we're going to rule this place. And that's kind of my approach, is just to say that, look, clearly, and this is why I completely disagree with Karl Liebner. Karl Liebner was a, was a neo-Kantian who thought that through kind of uh, morally brilliant actions and, and speeches could motivate lots of people. When he calls the German socialist, the socialist republic, in November 1918, that's madness. How, where, is the, where is the working class in power? The working class is nowhere near a socialist republic, right? They, they have not won power. And this, you know, so that, that, that's the point I'm trying to make is that the, the KPD with its small forces, et cetera, what it did eventually was actually kind of the right way, which was you know, through the so-called United Front tactics, working alongside criticizing the USPD leadership, et cetera, winning over people to uh, the Russian Revolution. That was the way to go, right? But in terms of a program, yes, I would be making, basically making the arguments that in order for uh, there to be genuine working class rule, we need the kind of democratic Republican demands that the, move, that the best parts of the movement have been arguing for for a long time. And some of them are there, Alan, to be fair. Uh, you know, so the, 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 the armed people, armed guards, etc., regular uh, elections, uh, albeit through the Soviets rather than in the state at large, etc. That's the that, that's the, the approach I, I'm taking here. It's not the, uh, just about the focus. It's about what do we do next in order to win support for this program to a point where we can actually become a force. We can get people elected. We can get our, our message out even more. 
and um, and, and therefore become a force in society, which is kind of what happened, to be fair. I, I, we, we don't have time to discuss Paul Levy, but I, I actually think that he was a, a, a very credible inheritor of that organization uh, and did a lot of good work, particularly, you know, by October 1920, the, the organization is, in, is now numbering in the hundreds of thousands, right? Um, so that would be, we must focus, don't give up the, the minimum program. The workers' class still needs to come to power and the Communist Party needs to make propaganda for that and exactly how it, how it looks. Um, Da, 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 da. Can you wind up? Now? Yeah, that's fine. I think I think I think I've addressed everything anyway. I'll, I'll find the Lenin quote by the time I uh, come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Okay, I'm gonna. There's a few more people who want to speak. That's why I'm rushing you along a little bit. Um, next to speak is Anne McShane. There you are. Hello, Anne. Hi. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. I'm still here. You. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Well, look. Firstly, I'd say. Um, Look, it's an extremely complex uh, question, I think. Um, everything that the speakers have said and every, everything, you know, that's been said by other people just makes me think of a, a situation that was just so unstable and not from the point of view of the bourgeoisie just, but that the working class um, was very weak because of the collapse of their uh, leading organisation in the face of war credits. It seems to me, particularly from what Ben is saying, that once the, once the SPD voted for war credits and the organization you know, uh, split, that really the situation was you know, qualitatively different. Um, so the question I really wanted to ask though was, um, the relationship between the Soviet, um, the Soviet Russia at the time, and Germany, and in particular to ask about the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. There are plenty of members of the Bolshevik Party who were critical of that treaty because they believed that the German Revolution had been sold out. I wanted to ask what the speakers think about that question. Obviously, from the point of view of the Russian government they had to do something to try and you know uh, defend themselves against the invading imperialist armies but from what i've read it seems and it would be clear that it would be the case that the fact that the german government was able to deal with the russian um deal with the russians gave it the strength to put down the revolution more effectively and um, that's just my question thanks Sorry, have I, have I been called in to speak there? <laughs> yeah, I think I have. Um, okay, um, well, when we're talking about revolution, what we're really talking about is um, working class people um, not just winning an election or taking um, political office, um, but actually taking control, to coin a phrase, um, of the the key levers, levers of the economy. Um, so that's, you know, uh, your key industries being publicly owned and democratically run in the interests of workers and society. And capitalists really hate that because um, if you've got that kind of economy, how are you supposed to make private profit? Uh, and the answer is you can't. So that, that, that is really what we're talking about, but that doesn't happen overnight. Um, that is a process. A revolution is not an event. A revolution is a process, uh, and then there are many stages to it. The only really successful revolution that's ever taken place uh, was in Russia in 1917. Um, Germany in, in, in 1918 onwards um, had the potential to win, uh, but failed. Um, so I think it's worth you kind of have to speak about both revolutions at once, really. Um, now, if you look at the process of the Russian Revolution, so they're at war, and there's millions of people dying on the front every day, and there's military defeats and starvation at home, um, and that leads to 
um, workers taking to the streets, going on strike and um, overthrowing the Tsar, the monarchy. Um, but at that stage, it's not, um, you know, Lenin wasn't in power then um, because although workers had decided they wanted to overthrow their uh, current um, power, uh, the monarchy, um, there wasn't exactly clarity on what should replace it. And there are many different strands, um, many different political strands um, of working class leadership. Um, so <clears throat> for about eight months or so, there are various different governments ruling Russia, some of which were more akin to the German SPD, some of which were more akin to the German USPD, uh, and some were more akin to uh, Luxembourg and Liebknecht. Um, and eventually the, uh, the Bolsheviks, um, which is kind of the equivalent of Luxembourg and Liebknecht, won. Um, but there was a period where the masses had to um, lose confidence in the, um, in the SPD, uh, or the, Rus the Russian SPD, um, the reformists. They had to see them in action, see them fail, um, before they then kind of accepted that actually we need to go um, the Bolshevik way. Um, and by the way, that included an attempted counter-revolution where a guy called Kornilov, who was a kind of general, tried to put the, put the monarchy back in power in Russia. So, um, so from the period of February to October in Russia, there was this whole revolutionary period of all these um, uh, events happening, which basically shape people's consciousness and it ends up with people realizing the need for genuine socialists, the Bolsheviks, to, to take power. Now in Germany, the first bit had happened, they got rid of their equivalent of the Tsar, which was the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, he was overthrown. But again, the German masses um, aren't speaking with one voice as to whether they want the SPD or the USPD. Um, there's lots of division and they haven't seen in practice they haven't experienced in practice themselves the failures of the SPD in government. Um, and so for that reason, I think there then had to be a period in Germany where there was lots of to and fro in um, and different events going on that would ultimately lead um, people to see the need for you know, Luxembourg and Liebknecht to take power. But the, the, the strategy and tactics that were used by the German socialists were quite different to uh, the Russian ones. Um, I think uh, ultimately what they ended up doing was, uh, partly as Pat has said, they did isolate themselves a little bit. Um, but then when um, people got very frustrated uh, and went for a revolution in uh, Berlin in, in, in January 1919, um, they moved too quick when the masses weren't fully, fully ready for them. Um, and that's what ended up with um, them, them being killed. Um, I think the equivalent of the January 1919 19 uprising in Berlin is probably the equivalent to what was known as the July days in, in Russia. Yeah. And that was um, something where the Bolsheviks actually uh, asked the demonstrators to not take power at that particular time because the rest of the country wasn't fully behind them. And I think what the German socialists did was they got a bit carried up in um what was going on in berlin and went a bit too early without the backing of the rest of the country um so I, I, the, the reason why we need to, to to know about these things today um i think we at the moment we, we you know we're in a situation where you do have these different strands of potential working class leaderships you do have your reformists your genuine socialists etc and you do have um, a mass of people that at this particular stage Although a significant number of activists understand what's going on, the large majority of the mass don't properly differentiate between the reformists and the genuine socialists. So I think we're still in this period where people need to see in practice um, the failings of the reformists in power before they'll see the need for um, genuine socialists to take control of the economy. Uh, and it's a shame with the Corbyn thing because... Um, that kind of fell apart before they, they got to power. So a lot of people, in, in terms of the wide masses of people, um, won't, won't now get to live through, through that experience. So that's, that's really what the setback in Corbynism, I think, has, um, 
has meant for us. Um, I'll just finish with, um, there's a, I was reading a, a Cole Liebknecht speech. Um, it's where he's trying to explain to um, a lot of the masses um, the paucity of the phrase unity. A lot of people wanted unity of all the different socialist groups. Um, and he was trying to say, well, if you have unity, the, the problem is that, you know, the SPD, they, uh, they're going to betray us, um, which of course they did. Um, but he, he puts it in quite an interesting way here. He goes, not all unity breeds strength. Unity between fire and water extinguishes the fire and turns the water to steam. Unity between wolf and lamb makes the lamb a meal for the wolf. Unity between the proletariat, which is the workers, and the ruling class sacrifices the proletariat. Unity with traitors means defeat. Only forces pulling in the same direction are made stronger through unity. When forces pull against each other, chaining them together cripples them both. And when you use that argument, it's obviously of key tactical importance, but I think it's quite a good way of um, putting across the, uh, uh, the difference and how unity isn't always um, the way forward. You need unity of um, the working class and unity in a socialist direction. Um, but Can um, you up, Alex, now? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, I have gone on a bit, so I'll, 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 I'll end it there. I've made my points. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. We're yeah. trying to finish at eight. I don't think that's quite going to work, but um, comrades could keep their questions and comments to about three minutes. I'm bringing in Paul Collins next. No, I'm unmuting you now. You can mute yourself again. Okay. No, there you are. Hello. Hello. Um, I'll mute this. Uh, um, obviously, I know a bit about Marxism, but not too much about the history. I just wanted to make a, a brief comment, really, about uh, the point that Pat made about the, the fractions. Um, you know, those elections they pretend they, they uh, should have been abolished. Or, I mean, I didn't know any of that history, but um, but um, but thinking about the Labour Party uh, today, um, obviously after Keir Starmer's election, um, I have sympathy on both sides for those that want to leave and those like myself that. Um, are intending to remain and see how things play play out. And I, I um, and obviously in terms of factions, for the left, um, the, the we're kind of going through that phase ourselves at the moment, um, because um, because it's with the NEC and so on. Um, the question is, how do we get back that control, the socialist wing of the party to ensure that we get a socialist platform, as it were? Um, my fear is that, that too many people uh, may have already left and, um, and uh, don't see the par party as relevant any longer. Um, but I also respect the point that Ben made that the Labour Party has a completely different uh, history compared to the German SPD. But uh, yeah, thanks for le letting me speak and um, I enjoyed it. Thanks for that. Thanks, Paul. Uh, the Labour Left Alliance does urge comrades to stay in the Labour Party, but we have to admit we are getting lots and lots of messages of people who are now leaving. Um, they can still be involved in the Le Labour Left Alliance, but we would prefer comrades to stay in the party and, and fight. Uh, the Labour Party is unlikely to bring about socialism, but it is a hugely important arena of the class struggle, especially in the last four years. I think that's become very, very obvious. Okay, next is Kevin Bean. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, it's, a, it's more of a question because uh, what, uh, what happens when you put your hand out right at the beginning, the points that you wanted to make, have been made by somebody else so um but i think you know they've been well made um it's a it's a question to pat and it comes um sorry it's a question to ben 
and it follows on from Emile's comments about the strategy of patience, and in particular, um, how that, um, you know, maybe it's contemporary resonance, and particularly in terms of this, uh, this idea of revolutionary consciousness. Um, uh, I was interested in your characterization of Lignast as a, a Neo-Kantian, and in particular, it seemed to me that on occasions that, um, you, you know, as a as an individual, and uh, maybe this represents something of the immaturity and the the difficulties of having formed the group under those conditions. That he is sort of carried away both by the moment and having, in a sense, um, sort of adopted a position or believed in the revolutionary position potential of the situation, then almost doesn't know how to take it forward. I mean, some some of the incidents from in the days in December and January, particularly, you know, the famous event where they call the mass demonstration, and in the famous uh, phrase, the masses are kept waiting and waiting, and they're there all day until the, the drizzle sends them home. And um, that's a good example, I think, of, of the sort of contradictions often in the position of, um, of, of sort of moving from one mood to another and I wondered how far that was was a product for example of having been so isolated for so long of um, of having for example um, a uh, you know a, a particular understanding of the nature of the Russian Revolution because as Alex said the events of the Russian Revolution took took place from February to October November what we're talking about here is a much more telescope uh, space of time but also in a very different society and with a very different tradition. And I, I was very glad, Ben, that you emphasized, um, you know, the, the power and the status and indeed the, the continuing support of the SPD. You know, the, this was a mass party in which when, the, uh, when the, 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 the workers and soldiers councils had elections could still get majorities and could in fact turn out large demonstrations, the equivalent of those of the USPD as well. So there was really still all to play for, and I think sometimes we forget, you know, the strength of that, that, um, that the, the SPD wasn't simply kept in power by, the, uh, by their deal with the German High Command. I think there's also something else which is important, which again has come up in the discussion, is that all sides had the experience of the Russian Revolution. Uh, you know, both in a negative and a positive sense, but also some misunderstandings of that revolution, quite and how it had unfolded, and indeed, I would even suggest um, of of the history of, of the revolution. Um, and I think we we still suffer from that our, ourselves. Um, for those of us who are pretty well monolingual, our inability, for example, to read the material in Russian or to read the material in German means that we often have to make do with really quite vulgarizations of the debates that were taking place. And it's very clear that the, the, um, even the USP, the right USPD leadership were quite determined that they weren't going to have a Russian revolution. And you know, we, we, we can see that this was quite a, a conscious strategy. Well, one, one last question as well, which uh, again came up right at the beginning, was on the issue of the mass strike. And indeed, of the juniors' pamphlet in the um, in the war, and I wonder again whether there whether there aren't you know at, at the heart of um, of both Leitnach and Luxembourg's position, although they take different positions around the the attempted rising in January 1919, whether there aren't some sort of real issues about the nature of revolutionary consciousness, and particularly about this idea of sort of dialectical leaps, and you know whether uh, in a sense, uh, some of Leibniz's understanding of the 1905, sorry, uh, Luxembourg's understanding of the 1905 revolution, in a sense, um, hindered how she was going to work both in the, in, in, in the First World War and then in the days that followed. But um, those are just some sort of general points. There's a lot really to discuss here. And as, as comrades have said, it's something that isn't, you know, well known enough in, in the British labor movement, what is probably you know, the single most important failed revolution um, in, in history. Quite right. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin, as you might or might not know, is also the um, uh, speaker at our Learning from Labour's History sessions, which take place every Thursday, and I can only recommend it. 
Okay, Matthew Jones is the next speaker from the floor. And there is somebody on your floor as well. Hello. We can't hear you. Actually, Matthew, we can't hear you. Um, you are unmuted, but I can't hear you. Is that better? Yes, yes, got you now. Yeah, okay, great. No, and I think there's, there's, there's various things. I think, um, you know, obviously, I mean, uh, the, 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 the problem is of contrasting, you know, compare and contrast Russia and Germany. And the problem being, of course, is they're quite different. Um, I, I think there are certain things you can draw in terms of, you know, the importance of 1905 as, as exactly the point of, of, of deriving a, a, a cadre of people who've actually been through a revolution, uh, even a failed one, and then, and then uh, you know, have that with them when they go through, through the real thing, you know, and actually manage to successfully overcome the issues that, that, they've, that they've seen in, in, in the first time round. You know, and, and obviously, if, you know, uh, Rosa Luxemburg is left contrasting the, 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 um, the uh, upsurge in, 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 in Russia with the quiescence of what's happening in, 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 in Germany and lamenting the fact that, that there isn't this, you know, any, anything, anything uh, similar happening in Germany, in Germany at the time. Um, I mean, I think, the, 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 I mean, I, I quite like, I mean, I, I think the comrades are correct, are correct to, or Ben is correct to draw, draw attention to Paul Levy. I quite agree with some of his positions. I mean, obviously the problem is that he's, he's then expelled from the, from the KPD, you know, for, precisely at the point where, you know, as you say, where, where he, he loses the conference and they throw him out, which is, you know, ridiculous. Um, you know, uh, and the, 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 the issue also, um, you know, in terms of looking at uh, how the, um, you know, you come to that, to that point, um, you know, and, and they fail to, to address uh, the, mass of, the mass of people and fail to bring together uh, all these, all these issues, all these, uh, these, these different elements and, and, and put together an appeal other than to, to a, small, a small group uh, is, 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 is instructive, but obviously a tragedy. And I, but I also disagree with Ben. I think Ben, ben talking about the minimum program is quite wrong. I mean, if you look at the, the, the lessons from, from elsewhere, I mean, and, and, and particularly as an old Trotskyist, uh, you know, the questions of, say, you know, bring in transitional questions at the point, you know, it's not merely minimum, it's about state power, it's about control of the banks and so on. And, and the questions that were raised, say, in the, in the critique of the Spanish Revolution, where, you know, the, 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 the CNT uh, actually has its headquarters opposite the Bank of Spain in Barcelona, and yet does not, does not wander through the doors, does not bother itself with wandering through the doors of the Bank of Spain. Um, you know, the, the, all of these things are, are present in, this, in the, that, that point of, of uprising, and all of these, these questions have to be addressed by, by the forces. Um, you know, as I, I think the, the, the point made by the comrades is quite right. There's a question of how do you, how do you put together the, the necessary cadre? And they didn't do it. And that, 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 that's critical. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I'm just going to bring in Alan again for a second bite of the cherry. Here we go. I've unmuted you. Go ahead. I've unmuted you. Now you've muted yourself again. I've unmuted you. <laughs> Okay, I'll... Two. There we go. There you go. Okay. Start on. Um, yeah, and it's, it's a, one issue we've got is um, that we're all looking at this with hindsight. Um, and we know that certain tactics turned out bad and uh, we can speculate on uh, general uh, strategic issues as well. And hindsight, we have great advantage with hindsight. Um, but there are, I still think, if you're looking at trying to learn lessons, you can look at uh, different situations and are there um, similar lessons that can be learned from these situations? And so I think that you have to, in terms of, uh, there's a couple of questions uh, in regard to that. Um, briefly, I'll say that I, I agree with Matt about the issue of the transitional program and the need to have a program which uh, goes beyond the minimum program and integrates the question of the seizure of power. But the two questions, one, I think, the question of separate organisation of revolutionaries um, around a clear revolutionary programme. That doesn't mean, um, particularly in the pre-World War I context, that you would split. No one thought of that. It was, was uh, something which came around because of the betrayal um, of August 1914 and the voting for war credits. But still, Lenin comes to this consciousness, the Spartacists come to this consciousness too late, 
and they have not done what the Bolsheviks had done for a very long time, which was to essentially organize as a separate party within the broader Social Democratic Party. And that lesson, I think, right. is very important, and particularly for your comrades working inside the Labour Party, the, the need to organize yourself as a revolutionary tendency and to work out what the program of that is. Uh, so that's an important point. Second point, um, and there have been a number of comments in the discussion and also in the chat around the question of judging the consciousness of the wider working class. And I think that in that context, you've got to understand the, that's one of the reasons why Soviets, workers' councils, factory committees, whatever form um, proletarian democracy takes in revolutionary and pre-revolutionary situations, their importance, one of the aspects of that importance is that they point to the um, nature of proletarian dictatorship and the state in the process of withering away, but also they are a good way to fight and in terms of judging consciousness, they are the best way that I can think of for a revolutionary party which is active in those struggles, in the struggles which are organized around those Soviets or factory committees or neighborhood committees or whatever form that takes for judging the revolutionary consciousness of the working class because it is such a direct form of democracy. You, you're able to judge your strength on the number of delegates you get elected in certain places. You can, you can make that and, you, and you're less likely to make mistakes. So a big, and so we see that because the, they were not involved in the, that's my time, I'll finish. You're alarmed. You set yourself an alarm. Yeah, yeah, three minutes. Very That's good. It. I had my own. I was very disciplined. Okay, I'll bring in Ben first this time. Um, here you go. I'll unmute you. There you go. Okay, there's a lot here, comrades, and also in the chat, which is confusing me occasionally, but I'll do my best to uh, bring things together. The, the one key thing I, I think I wish to bring out is this question of Pat's assertion about the USPD, SPD uh, coalition government representing some form of workers' government, right? Because I think that's that's misleading, uh, and I didn't explain why. That was the one difference I didn't explain in my last one. Um, the reason is this. The... The, the entire plan from the start is is not to bring about any form of socialism, right? That's why uh, Leibniz is wrong, just purely wrong, neo-Kantian, whatever, uh, when he says, we're, we're now, I declare the socialist republic. Socialist republic means the working class is in power, right? The SPD and the USPD form a caretaker government. They do not uh, do anything to the army of significance. In fact, and this relates to the question about the army, they form what's known as the Ebert Gröner Pact, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a pact between uh, the head of the SPD and the head of the German military forces that says, look, we will not do this to you if you do make sure that you keep the council movement in check and sort out the Russian revolution, right? That's the fundamental thing. Now, to describe that as a workers' government, where one of the, uh, the, the, the preconditions of uh, a workers' government is uh, uh, the, the abolition of the standing army, and the armed population, right, which isn't kind of left-wing madness, that goes back through the entire tradition of the workers' movement through, uh, through Engels, uh, uh, through Kautsky, Babel, through Engels and Marx, etc. That is seriously misleading. You can then go to the economy, you can go to the ministerial bureaucracy. A good example for, for, this, for this is, oh, what do we do about the foreign ministry? Now, the foreign ministry is very worried about the Russians, right? So they think, hmm, well, we don't want to leave people like Wilhelm Zolf and all these other officials of the Kaiserdom. Uh, we don't want to get rid of them. So what we can maybe do, we'll send Kautsky in there and he can then give us a kind of socialist face uh, to say that we're running the foreign ministry. What they end up doing, Zolf and his officials carry on with their reactionary plans, right? <laughs> Mobilizing the forces that they have. And they send Kautsky off to write a very good book, by the way, on the origins of First World War and German guilt, right? That, that's, that's the workers' government in action. So you have this, you know, this council system, right, which is, as Alan pointed out, very democratic, has its own structures, has its own national leadership, etc. But that, born of that is the true political leadership of the country, at least temporarily, these six commissars, three of each until the USPD leave, because they've had enough of it, right? Um, and all the time, that government is not doing anything to the state apparatus, is not fundamentally driving forward the revolution. And in that sense, I think it's a mistake to call it a workers' revolution. And uh, uh, Sorry, a workers' government. And, and there's a mistake on both sides. On the one hand, uh, this Liebknecht who thinks, no, the workers in power, wrong. Kautsky, by the way, and I can send you an article on this, uh, Pat, 
Kautsky actually thinks at this time, and I, I pillory him for this, uh, uh, thinks that there is a workers' government, that there's a socialist government, right? And I go through Kautsky's earlier works and use his, use his, uh, um, uh, his, his preconditions of a workers' government and say and show why they don't exist in 1918-19, right? They simply are not there. So I think it's problematic to call it a workers' government. Uh, a workers' government, and this leads me on to the question of the transitional program, the minimum program. Again, I'll bring up my Lenin this time, right? It is, it is false to imply that the common understanding of the minimum, pro, the revolutionary understanding of the minimum program in the Second International, including by Lenin, uh, it does not deal with the question of state power, as Alan put it, right? And I will read, this is from Lenin, a few days before the October Revolution in 1917, right? He says, uh, we, do, we do not know when our victory will come. No one is in a position to know. I think it will be in the next few days, he says. He said, it is therefore ridiculous to discard the minimum program, which is indispensable while we still live within the framework of bourgeois society, which I think in Germany 1919 was still the case, right? It's, it's a strange bourgeois society, there's lots of things going on, but it's bourgeois society, right? Uh, while we have not yet destroyed that framework, not yet realized the basic prerequisites for a transition to socialism, not yet smashed the enemy, the bourgeoisie, which the SPD is kind of pushing back into the saddle, and even if we have smashed them, and we have not yet annihilated them, all this will come sooner, than, much sooner than people will think. So what Lenin's, Lenin's fundamental point is, you know, we do not discard the minimum program because the minimum program is the basis on which we will take power. And he thinks that will happen in a few days time, right? Uh, but, that's, but that's the thing. And that's my basic point in Germany. It's kind of very misleading, in my opinion, given that how small and disorganized the revolutionary forces were, how, as other comrades have said, how they were, they were under the yoke of the far more organized, far more rooted SPD. It's incredibly misleading, misleading to describe that as a workers' government or a socialist uh, 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 society. That's, that's my basic point. And in order to get there, what the KPD, in my opinion, should have done, I absolutely agree with Alan's point on hindsight, right? I'm criticizing one of the greatest thinkers of Marxism here, but I do it from the comfort of my chair, you know, a hundred odd years later. It's much easier to look at these things when they've happened, right? But what I'm saying is that the KPD, uh, under the tutelage of Rosa Luxemburg in this case, abandoned that basic abandoned that basic perspective, which left it with very little to say then when the councils were going away, and they kind of fall back on, oh well, some spontaneous strikes maybe will lead it to social. It didn't work. Levy comes and and readjusts that focus, and I think uh, 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 correctly. But I just wanted to make that uh, point about the minimum program. It's not a minimal program. It's the program for working class power, and that was how it was understood. Certainly from from Engels onwards, right? You can go back to Marx too, but that's how it was understood and that's how Lenin understood it in 1917 in October. Uh, just quickly on the strategy of patience, what I would say, I'm sorry that I didn't come back to that, what I would say is that the um, working class politics is not just about strikes and working class actions and demonstrations. So that's one thing that the, the, the SPD got right and what, why it was able to do what it was, what it was able to do. It's about a vision for society as a whole. And if you, there's, a, there's a book I'm currently meant to be uh, uh, reviewing at the moment called Weimar Communism as Mass Movement. And there's actually one of the good things the KPD does later on, for all that I've slated it, when it becomes a mass organization, one of the things it does is precisely uh, try to assert its own uh, uh, campaigning image, its own identity, its own workers' organizations, and I did some great work in that. So, you know, the proletarian hundreds, right, they were, they were armed forces, for example, that combined workers from, th that were loyal to the SPD, for example, on a basic level to defend, uh, uh, you know, the, the democratic freedoms that they had. So all I would say is that what the left should have done in that sense is to utilize the freedoms that it won. Clearly, there have been freedoms that have been won. You could, you know, there were elections, you could stand for them. Uh, and, and to propagate its message and to become uh, a, ma a big enough organization to start asserting itself and then raise really the prospect of how do we enact our minimum program, how do we get the working class uh, to power. Just one last thing on elections. I, I think I agree with Alan's point about elections as gauges of support and clearly to answer, uh, I, I think it was Peter's uh, question at the start, yeah, Peter Kennedy, about where, where workers are at. Well, look at the election results. That gives you a fairly good you know, summary of where at. Women voted, I think it, at about 85%, most of them voted SPD, right? Lots of people are voting the center uh, Catholic party, right? Some people are voting liberal. So you can kind of see how that society works out where the working class is at. And, and there are a lot of elections during the Weimar Republic, so you can see that as well. And one thing we shouldn't remember, uh, so one thing we shouldn't forget is that the Bolsheviks in 1917, they're not just gauging their support 
on Soviet elections. They're also winning local elections, right? <laughs> they're actually winning local elections. They can say, right, we won here, we won there, we've got this support here. It's a very good uh, uh, way of, of, of approaching things. Um, I think, uh, just on, on Brest-Litovsk very quickly and then, I think Brest-Litovsk, um, yes, fundamentally was uh, um, the way in which the German military elite finally kind of dealt with their fears about the Russian question. Obviously, they've been putting down uh, armed organizations, etc., and, and the revolution all over the place. Finland, if you look at the Finland Finnish counter-revolution, how many people died there and shot by Germans uh, and German military personnel is, is quite astounding. Uh, but I think that was a, 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 a concession the Bolsheviks clearly need to make, but it did have massive ramifications for revolutionary developments in Germany. I will stop there. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, okay, now over to Pat to sum up. Okay, thanks, Tina. Um, just firstly, quickly to deal with this workers' government thing. I think there's a lot of confusion here. I don't understand where that's coming from. Um, a workers' government is not a socialist government. You know, if... if, if, if um, uh, Corbyn had been elected as leader of a Labour government, I would have called it a workers' government. But I mean, maybe other people call it something different. I don't see where they get that from. It's basically the Workers' Party become a government. Actually, Lenin came around to the idea of workers' governments uh, in, the, in, this, in the last couple of years, um, as did the common turn as a whole, because it, what else could you do? If, you're in, if you're, you've got to argue for no capitalist parties. And the, the slogan in the Russian Revolution was down the capitalist ministers. Do you remember that? So that was, it was initially to say that basically the socialist parties, uh, the, uh, the well, parties of the left should form the government, they should have no capitalist ministers. And uh, that was a position of, of the second international as well. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a lot more complicated than this. Yes, we could make all the criticisms we want of this uh, workers' government that was in power for a short time. Um, and we could do that of any workers' government has ever been. Uh, we, and some have been far worse than others. The advantage that the independent socialists gain by participating in that government and criticizing it, because you don't participate in a government that does bad things and you don't uh, criticize them, was that uh, participating in it and then breaking from it at a key moment was that they, they appeared much more credible among the workers. And that was reflected in the following election where they, the, F, the independent socialists emerged on an equal footing as SPD. And that's an important thing you've got to take into account. The, uh, the question of Brest, Anne raised about Brest oh, that's a big issue, unfortunately. Um, it's true that uh, Rosa saw this um, as a sellout by the Bolsheviks because what it did do on the German side was it strengthened the regime, uh, the German regime, because it gave them a victory and all the rest of it. As it turned out, it was very short-lived, so it didn't really matter that much. Um, there is an argument, there's a very interesting argument which is starting to bubble up, uh, which is that the, the Bolsheviks made a mistake on the Brest-Litovsk tr Treaty and that they might have been better off to have launched a guerrilla campaign. But, but that's an interesting question, which is that we haven't got time to go into. Um, Alec gave this excellent quotation from Liebnik, which, by the way, shows the, the level, the political level of these comrades that we're talking about. We might cr raise criticism of them, but these people like Luxembourg, Liebnik and so on were amazing figures uh, compared to the type of socialist uh, leaders we've got today. Um, now, another thing that Alec raised, which I think is very, very true, he raised about the parallels with the Russian Revolution. And I like to say, because I've studied a lot of different revolutions, and I've noticed that there's a rhythm to each of them that repeats, a pattern that repeats. It's very interesting. And so, as he pointed out, in the, the, the botched uh, uprising in Berlin in 1919, was very much like the July days in, 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 the, in the 1917 in the Russian Revolution. And of course, the Bolsheviks took a different approach. Um, when, when Radek came from Moscow, when he came from Petrograd, and he saw what happened in Berlin in 1919, he arrived just at, during the events. He was totally slated the role played by Liebknecht and Luxembourg. And he said, how could you possibly do this? Uh, it was just such an adventuristic approach that they took. And ironically, um, they did it partly because they were in rivalry with the uh, Independent Social Democrat uh, Revolutionary uh, Workers Committee. It's an odd story that happened. Um, so they, they made a mistake in, in, in Berlin 19. Similarly, in, a year later in 1920, the Cap Putsch, where the generals tried to rise up against the, uh, the SPD government, um, was very similar to the Kornilov attempt uh, that, uh, that Alec talked about, where they tried in the Russian Revolution to overthrow the provisional government. And very interesting to see the way the Bolsheviks approached both events so differently to the way the Spartacists and communist leaders did. 
and, and, and made a huge difference to this, their success in winning a majority and taking forward the revolution. Um, Paul mentioned about he saying that he hadn't heard about um, Rosa and the fractions, uh, the fraction question. And I hadn't either until I went into this. And I had always wondered to myself, why was it that Rosa, after having played such an important role on the left of the SPD earlier, before the war, why was she so weak at the beginning of the war? And then it made sense because she hadn't actually organized a, a group, you know. And obviously, if you don't organize, you, you, you don't, you just leave things in a very spontaneous format. Now, how could we go forward in the Labour Party? Uh, Paul posed that question. Um, I would say, and uh, this is something we failed to do in the after the 1980s and 70s, we should carefully study what went wrong in the Corbyn project and learn from the mistakes and not, because I think we could in the future, we could have another chance, contrary to what a lot of people think. And we must not make the mistakes we made under Corbyn. And I think that's very important. And that could be a whole different discussion, couldn't it, I think. Um, Kevin talked, uh, raised the question of um, Karl Liebknecht's character, in, and he made some very good points about that. And yeah, sadly, Karl Liebknecht didn't come from a Marxist background. He, he was very much an individualist character uh, with a very much a moralistic approach. Uh, he, he emerged as a kind of a peace, uh, arguing for peace against war. And um, he did tend to act on his own and take his own um, initiatives. And because of his, his lack of um, experience in the movement, uh, it showed in certain key moments of, of, his, um, of the struggle. Um, Matthew uh, compared uh, Russia and Germany. Um, I think I've already talked about how in many ways there were a lot of comparisons we made. Um, but sadly, uh, and this was not true just of uh, Germany, but it was true across the whole world, that the, the lessons of how the revolution was actually achieved were not known abroad. A lot of the things we're talking about now, we know in hindsight, but actually how the, the challenges that they faced in the Russian Revolution, which were typical of a revolutionary development, and how they overcame them were never written about and never spoke about generally until much later. And sadly, the, the, the leaders of the German movement uh, didn't know these things. And that becomes clear when you read all the, the things they write about and what they do. They didn't learn those things. Um, now, Paul Levy has been mentioned by... Um, a couple of people by uh, by Ben and by Matthew, and I, I agree with you. I think Paul Levy was a was a, given his limitations was was an amazing uh, figure in this period. Now he became the leader of the communists in 1919 after the assassination of Luxembourg, Liebknecht, and Josic, and he was thrust into this position. He wasn't really suited for it as a as a temperamentally, but one thing he did was he learned the lessons of the mistakes they'd made in the earlier period, and he particularly stood for the United Front. And he pushed that issue and he made a lot of success with it. But sadly, uh, by 19, uh, end of 1920 into 1921, he got, he got mixed up with the whole debacle over the rise of uh, the split in the Italian movement, the rise of Mussolini and so on. And uh, he, he fell foul of the machinations of, of the Communist International, which was fast degenerating, and they organized his removal. And in my view, that spelt final doom for the revolution in Germany. But that's a, he's a figure that I think uh, any comedy is interested should study. He's, he's written some very, very good things and, and did some very interesting stuff. But I wanted to finish on this was that, um, and I'll try and make a couple of parallels to the current situation. So, so people don't feel we're having an esoteric st study about you know, past history that's irrelevant. Um, I would argue, if you talk about the role of the SPD leadership during the war and at the end of it, it reminds me, when I read through the leaked Labour Party HQ report and the creatures in the, the right wing elements in there and their attitude towards the rest of the party and so on, it reminded me of the role of these SPD leaders. It's so hostile to the left and to the party membership um, and to what we were fighting for. Um, now, I think um, uh, the, the other lessons I can, I can say is that I think that we, we need to always bear in mind in, in, in our work in the party, in the Labour Party and so on, that we should be working towards a change, a drastic change of society, a democratic social society. And we shouldn't abandon this aim, as sadly too many in our social democratic movement have done, uh, as Bernstein did in his day, and as we see today with the Blairites and all the rest of them, you know. The other lesson I think we need to do is we've got to avoid sectarianism. We've got to be, we, we keep our we put forward our principles, we put forward our criticisms, but we've got to work together with other trends on the left and not break away. 
because by doing so, you just divide the movement and you become weaker and, it, and you come to disaster. Okay, I'll leave it there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you very much, Ben. I thought that was really fascinating. We've had uh, a few very good comments already and a very critical comrade who usually sends us uh, comments about it not being, not having been very good, said this was by far the best webinar we had. <laughs> and I enjoyed it very much as well. Clearly you two are uh, experts on the matter, but it also helps that you debated various issues. And I think that's, a, it's actually a strong point, learning from people disagreeing over uh, something or other. So that, that always helps. We do want to put out a call to people who are still listening. There's over 40 people still on this call. If you do have a particular expertise, if you do have a particular interest, um, like the comrades have on the German Revolution, please get in touch because we are looking for, for comrades to uh, introduce sessions, etc. We are running two webinars a week at the moment and are very keen to keep that going, but we also need to have a bit of content. Something quite basic on Marxist concepts, I think, would be fantastic. You know, Marx and nature, Marx and religion, alienation, etc. So would be really cool. Uh, revolutionaries and revolutions, I think that's always something we have to learn from, or even current issues that people are interested in and debating. So please, if you have expertise, if you are keen to have a debate or have a, 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 an opening, make an opening, please get, get in touch. It's info at labourleft.org. Thanks very much again to our speakers and thanks very much to the audience. We're up to uh, 90 people, I think, in the audience, which is great. And I hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye.